Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, uh, the next, uh, uh, next part of uh, our conference is uh, an invited lecture. And this year, uh, the, today, uh, we have uh, Professor Paul Alberg Ostergaard. Uh, and the title is Desert, uh, Diversification and Dispersion of Heating and Cooling uh, Production in the Energy Transition. Uh, well, uh, Paul is a professor in energy planning uh, at the Department of Sustainability and Planning uh, at Alberg University. Uh, he holds a PhD in energy planning uh, with special focus on integrated uh, resource planning and the organizational structure of the energy sector. Uh, he is conducting research in this field from um, 1995 with a lot of uh, uh, research papers, uh, projects, etc. Uh, and uh, he is a, a program director uh, of the master program in sustainable, sustainable energy planning and management at Dahlberg University. He is involved in teaching, of course, in Denmark, but in some other countries like Nicaragua, Jordan, and others. Okay, Malaysia. Um, he's uh, ah yeah. He's the editor in chief of the International Journal of Sustainable Energy Planning and Management, and he is actually uh, an international scientific committee member uh, of SDEVES from 2013, something like that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, Paul, the floor is yours. I will mark the time and just give you. automatically so thank you very much those of you here in the audience and those of you sitting behind that camera in the back of the room listening somewhere in the world um, so my name is Paul and uh, thank you very much for the very long introduction to me I didn't write that myself I, because I found I heard some new things in that that I had not uh, heard before so uh, so that's good but I'm also a member of the uh, International Scientific Committee of the Stavis Conference, so I think that's one of the reasons why I was invited to present here. So I will talk a little bit about the diversification of heating and cooling in the energy transition. And uh, I will start by introducing some concept notes or some concept articles that uh, we have made at uh, my research group. We have introduced some terms in in the district cooling, we have introduced terms of generations to see an involvement in, in district cooling. We have made something similar within district heating, and within district heating I will also show a little bit about how this has basically affected the, the Danish energy system. As from the title, we have diversification, we have been spreading to different sources, we have made a dispersion basically also. We have moved production to smaller and smaller sites. It is not a, an energy system with large central producers. It's an energy system of many hundreds of small producers of heating basically. I will uh, take that in the context of the transition to renewable energy systems basically because uh, it is one of my beliefs that uh, integration across different sectors is something that facilitates the energy transition because it gives us some options. And heating and cooling and introducing that into a more systematic way of uh, treating our energy systems basically provides us with some uh, feasibility options, some flexibility options, some efficiency options that we will not uh, be able to harvest or harness if we are taking the energy systems as separate entities. Lastly, to put a little bit of a Chilean footprint on uh, my presentation, I will introduce uh, Heat Roadmap Chile, which was uh, developed by a group of my colleagues, uh, where they assessed what is actually the heating demand and how can it be met in the Chilean context. Um, when I first said that I would talk about district heating, uh, some of my or some of the co-organizers they said oh you can't talk about heating in uh, in uh, south america it's warm uh no it's not uh, i think they could even turn up the heating in this room today uh, but it is not simply a northern european thing although in reality right now district heating it is kind of an, a northern european thing but it does not have to be that way so uh, we have 
different options in the world. Also New Zealand, I've been hearing some presentations about New Zealand today and I did not really hear much about district heating there and I think that could also actually be an option there. So let me uh, start by talking about district cooling and this is going to be based on a paper that I wrote with a bunch of colleagues and the good thing for you is that if you care about district heating and you don't have a subscription to Science Direct and all the Elsevier journals, then it's open access. So you can actually go in and read about our concepts of district heating generations. Sorry, district cooling. So if we uh, go back in time, district cooling was actually started several hundred years ago. Well, not several, but uh, more than 100 years ago, closer to 150 years ago. I will start by introducing the first generation, which was the one introduced at that point, and then coming up towards later generations. As opposed to uh, district heating, where we see more like a progression, within district cooling, it's not necessarily a progression, because it's simply so that some district cooling systems, they are more appropriate in some climates than others. So even though we call it, for instance, second generation district cooling, that does not mean it's outdated. Whereas if we were talking about second generation district heating, that would basically be outdated. But second generation district cooling is still very relevant in, in some climates, basically. So I will talk about the different generations. I will talk about the current market situation for district cooling and look into some of the, the prospects, basically, for district cooling. This is going to be with a global outlook, but also with a European context setting. Uh, I don't have much information about the, the district cooling potentials in, in South America, but I'm sure that uh, there are potentials also here. <coughs> so without further ado, the very first ones, they were introduced in the United States back in the uh, 19th century. So about 150 years ago, and at that time it was simply done for convenience. This is, I have a quote here from the oldest article that I have ever had to reference. It's from 1891, that article. And this is an article detailing the Colorado uh, district cooling system. At that time, if you were a butcher, you would buy big blocks of ice and you would put it in the storage room together with the meat, and uh, then uh, it would uh, do its job, basically. And you had to carry ice, and it's humid, and it's burdensome, and it's really not nice working conditions. So the very first cooling systems that were introduced in the world, that was simply to avoid handling ice. It was to avoid the humidity and the poor working conditions. You started by simply sending out refrigerants and in a pipe of uh, one inch you could supply something like 4,000 cubic meters of storage with cooling. So it's really massive compared to the alternative that you had before. So it was very practical, it was very powerful so to speak because a one inch pipe is not very thick. So you have a tremendous capacity for supplying cooling in such a system. Denver, New York, but they have been phased out since. They are not any longer operating and the system, even though it was, one of, one of the primary reasons for this was basically its powerfulness, that you could transport a liquid fuel, evaporate it somewhere, release or, or rather take up heat, provide cooling, and it was very efficient, but it was, or rather it was very powerful, but it was not very efficient necessarily. So it was an expensive type and it was more for practical reasons that you had this. And now I'm moving to uh, the second generation. And as I said, second generation, that does not mean that uh, it does not still operate here and there in the world. So here we've moved away from actually sending a refrigerant to moving water basically, chilled water, you could chill it on a chiller, or also known as a heat pump, and then you circulate it. So it is not as powerful basically because you don't have the evaporation of the refrigerant, so you have larger flows that you need to send to take up the same amount of heating basically. 
but it does provide you with other means of actually producing it. And it's something that was introduced in the 1960s, for instance, in Hartford in the US, but also in other places up to and including today. So sending out chilled water. Of course, typically produced on electricity. You have a compression chiller running on electricity. It could also be an absorption chiller, but that's uh, not so much used. So typically, uh, compression chillers based on, on electricity. You're moving away from the food industry. You're moving into commercial offices and so on. That is a certain element of uh, economy of scale in, in such systems that make them very uh, useful, basically, in inner cities, for instance. Uh, moving on to the third generation. Now we are moving a little bit away from this uh, solo string. We have a compression chiller. We have a uh, cooling demand. We are moving into more diversified production technologies. So uh, it is still comfort cooling in buildings, economy of scale. There was a large element of the phasing out of CFC gases. So the replacement of individual air conditioners, basically, which are typically based on some CFC. The big ones here, they can also be based on CFCs, but it, there is a little bit easier to actually get the CFC out and put some other refrigerant into the, the, the cooling loop, basically. So, but it is also looking into a diversification, other technologies. It can even be free cooling. Uh, it basically take cold lake water or something. Again, it is something that is not as powerful as the, the first generation systems, basically, because you really need to transport a lot of water. If, you, uh, if you're trying to cool something with a 10 degree water and you can take five degrees out of that water, maybe the flow rates are, are quite high compared to what you can do with uh, evaporative uh, cooling, basically. It's the main expansion technology in the somewhat cooler countries because in these countries you have the option of having also free cooling. Like uh, we're building a hospital in my town and even though my time it's at uh, 57 north, if you take that to Chile, that would be south of Tierra del Fuego. So it is uh, far north, but still we have a cooling demand. Of course we have the Gulf Stream so we can't quite compare the, the climates of Denmark and, uh, and South America. But still, even at our latitude, you have cooling demands. But for this, for instance, we are using a large pit, a large uh, cement pit or a chalk pit for cement production. Uh, so you have a nice layered pit, 25 meters deep. It's, uh, it's a wet process. So you have some nice cold water you can actually use. And we're using or going to use that for the new hospital that we are building. So it's a combination of free cooling and compressors. So you can play on, on different uh, keys on the keyboard, basically, when you are optimizing the, the energy system. It's the same you have in Paris, Stockholm, Helsinki, and other places. But it's somewhat cooler places. Moving on to fourth generation district cooling. There we are much more focused on the integration with the rest of the energy system. Of course, the former systems, they were also including the electricity connection, sector coupling there. But for the fourth generation, there's a much stronger connection to, for instance, district heating. So, of course, when you have a chiller, then you will also be producing heat. And if you are in a normally cold country, then you will actually have a potential use of that heat. Whereas if you are in a warm country, then it's not really a, a useful uh, commodity that you have there. There are some Dutch systems, uh, Swiss systems, uh, Stanford, Danish systems. Got a bit lighter suddenly. So typically in, uh, in colder climates where you can actually make use of the, the heating that you will also be producing. We made a nice chart here. I think the resolution is not so good here on the projector. But basically, we have the different generations along the horizontal <coughs> axis. We can basically, even if you can't see the details, it is, it is 
showing the variety of technologies. So the more uh, colorful blocks you have here on the, on the chart, the more different technologies are playing into the system. We have tried to indicate that uh, the temperature that we are using, they will be increasing typically with the newer generation. And is that good? Well, if you can supply the same cooling demands with a higher temperature. Yeah, I, I was getting fed off standing over there. So if you, uh, if you can supply the same cooling using uh, higher temperatures, then it's good for the efficiency of whatever units you have, basically. Whether it's a compression chiller, whether it is uh, a waste stream, whether it is uh, free cooling. So the higher temperatures we can supply the same cooling with, basically, the better. So the market for district cooling is something that is clearly expanding worldwide. So it is applied in a number of different countries, and it is applied more and more. I'll not mention all the countries, but just mention that some of these are comparable in size to district heating systems. So uh, install capacities in excess of 100 megawatts. So relatively large systems. But, but still relatively small compared to district heating, but 100 megawatts and, and, and that kind of system, that is still somewhat large. If we look at where we have district cooling systems in Europe, unfortunately I could not find a newer map. There are some nice people who made this map uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but it is kind of interesting that a lot of the development is actually in Sweden. And even if you haven't been to Sweden, you might have heard that uh, last week they set a record of minus 44 and a half degrees. So it's not a warm country. So why on earth have district cooling in Sweden? Well, that's because sometimes you need district cooling, even though it's a cold country. So, and I'm saying this because uh, it goes to the argument: uh, Why do you need district heating in uh, Chile? Because that's a warm country. Well, it's not always warm. Sometimes it's actually cold. So district cooling can be used in what we would normally consider cold countries, and district heating can be used in what we normally consider warm countries. So both have roles to play. Here's a little bit newer data showing the penetration of, uh, of district heating, or not the penetration, but uh, the actual amounts. So we can't really see out of, out of the potential use but we can see that, for instance, Japan has increased quite a lot. So here we have a logarithmic scale. So going back to 1970, it was very low. And now it's up to 10, 15 petajoules per year. For other countries, we've seen the same development. In my case, Sweden again, a very steep inclination since the 1990s. And up to, what would that be? Four or five petajoules per year. So this is more than, for instance, in Italy and Germany and countries which typically have a warmer climate than, than in Sweden. So it is not limited by climatic regions, basically. We have cooling demands in different places. One of the reasons, of course, is that the further north you go, typically the better insulated the houses are. Um, I've been involved with some uh, heating or district heating roadmaps. And the funny thing is that in Denmark, you have more or less the same potential for district heating as you have in Spain, even though Spain is much warmer. But Danish houses are better insulated. So our demand for heating is not directly reflected by our climatic region nor is the, the Spanish heating demand. So uh, different insulation standards has a very large effect on what we can actually uh, use in the different houses here. So uh, northern houses, good insulation, good in the winter time, but it's poor in the summertime because then it overheats, basically. Just Basically, comparing district heating and district cooling, I already mentioned that even though district 
cooling is increasing a lot. It is also something which is, uh, I wouldn't say it pales into insignificance compared to uh, district heating, but it is uh, still quite low. It's like one out of 1,000 of the demand if we look into a European system where 13 percent of the of the heating demand in EU 27 is covered by district heating only about 1.6 percent of the cooling demand is covered by district cooling so there's definitely uh, some options uh, for improvement there typically delivered by six degree returning at 16 so a temperature difference of 10 if we compare that to district heating, then you have a temperature difference of 50. So basically, you can take a lot more power out of a district heating pipe than you can for a district cooling pipe. Of course, if we're using water, which we prefer to do, then there's a, I guess you can guess what is the limit to how low you can go with the, the pipes there. Well, you don't want to go below zero, for instance. That would not work very well. So the pipes also figure when you we're talking about district cooling than when we're talking about district heating. This is a local case from uh, Aarhus. So this is a bit further south from where I live, but still it's uh, further north than uh, Patagonia and the Tierra del Fuego is south when we're talking about Chilean context. So putting big pipes into the ground just for the heck of it, I just showed you the, the weather forecast when I was making this presentation a week ago. So you see it is actually cold up there, minus 6, minus 10, minus 9, whatever degrees. So despite the very cold, they were actually out there putting uh, district cooling pipes into the ground. And this was for an office building, but with a very strong focus on the integration with the district heating system. So whenever you introduce these systems, mainly in Northern Europe, then you are making sure to utilize the heating, either directly or storing it, or, of course, ultimately, you might need to get rid of it, basically. But even in the cooling season, you'll still have a heating demand, which might sound a bit strange, but that's because you have domestic hot water. And domestic hot water is usually about one quarter of the, of the heating demand in, in a Danish, Scandinavian, northern German context. So uh, you will still have heating demands even in the middle of the summer. This is a system being installed in the Middle East, and there you can also see the sheer magnitude of the pipes. So it's very large pipes that you need to basically use when you're supplying cooling through water because of the limitations in the temperature difference that you can actually operate with. So I've tried to, uh, to split up district cooling into different generations, but actually more in terms of what kind of systems they, they fit into rather than like a sequential generation uh, context. So. We have made something similar for district heating, so that's why we also call it generations here. It is uh, important to establish this vocabulary when we're talking about cooling, basically. Also to discuss it, to ad address it academically. We have few district cooling systems, but it's definitely something that can expand. But there's very large development prospects and especially efficiency improvement potentials. That was a little bit about the cooling side of the equation. Now I will flip the coin and talk about the heating. And uh, it's, to some extent, it is very much the same, just different. It is still a thermal need. It's still a thermal need that we need to incorporate into our general energy systems analysis. It is something that provides us with efficiency potentials. It is something that provides us with flexibility for incorporating or, or integrating variable renewable energy sources into the energy system. So by that standard, they can basically provide some of the, the same energy 
services to the system. They will provide comfort temperature, whether it's heating or cooling, and they will provide flexibility and options for the energy system. So, I took a slide that I used for some policymakers, so you will have to permit the simplicity. This is what we need. This is what we want. We want to be able to turn up the temperature. That is my hand and my radiator, by the way. And we have different options. Either you can have your boiler. This is an oil boiler. And as you can see, it is not new. It is not fancy. It is old. It is dirty. You need to transport oil to it, basically. You need to have someone come and kick it once in a while and to uh, remove a uh, slag and whatever falls to the bottom of the boiler. Or you can have, and again, this is my home installation, this is my basement. I have two pipes coming in through the foundation to my house into my basement. And then it, by pipes, run up to the radiators. And I also have a, this is in a heat exchanger for domestic hot water. So, in a European context, district heating is very much a convenience issue. Basically, this never goes wrong. This does, when I was a kid, we had an oil boiler, not this one. But you'd always have someone coming and fixing it and paying money for that. Our heat exchanger, we've not had anyone looking at No plumber has looked at it for the last 30 years or so. It just keeps running. If I had a boiler with any mechanical, electrotechnical components, that would not happen. So from a convenience perspective, you don't have to think about anything, basically. I'm, I'm not trying to sell district heating to you. I'm not a district heating salesperson. I'm just trying to explain why people actually enjoy having district heating. So that's convenience. Another element, that is the cost element. The blue line here, that shows the district heating cost for all the different uh, district heating companies in Denmark. So when you have like a, a horizontal segment, that's because you have one company supplying uh, like 15% uh, of the market, that must be one of the big cities. And then you have a lot of smaller ones so at different levels. And for comparison, I put the uh, oil boilers and natural gas boilers. So for 95% of consumers in Denmark, it is a good thing to basically have district heating. It is cheaper than the alternative. And then, of course, you'll say, yeah, but why do you then have some which are more expensive? Well, that's because those plants should never have been built. They were built under the wrong assumptions or so. And uh, they should be, they should try to stop that system immediately and get some uh, individual heat pumps or something like that or a solar collector. So uh, for most, it is cheap. This chart here, it shows the data before we had the price increases that we got from uh, the Russian invasion and the phasing out of natural gas. It is economically robust also, because basically we have different options. I'll come back to that in a, in a later slide. And then again, yes, some should not have been built, but uh, we can't do anything about that. It's robust in terms of what units we can actually have. I can move over here a bit also. This is a chart made by my German colleague, uh, Bernd Müller, that some of you probably know, um, showing how we have different grids. We have an electricity grid, we have a heating grid, and for the heating grid, you can have a number of different units providing heating for that system. So whether that is uh, industrial, commercial, waste heat, whether it's heat pumps, whether it's geothermal plants, uh, whether it's power to X, big thing in the future, 
data storehouses, basically, they are providing a lot of district heating today. I mean, Facebook, when they're using 200 megawatts of electricity, basically, for storing data, they are more or less also providing 200 megawatts of, uh, of district heating. So if you take these data storehouses and basically put them nearby a city with a district heating system, then you are saving 200 megawatts of heat that you would otherwise be producing some other way. So having district heating systems gives you a sink, basically, for these very large excess heat productions that uh, you will foresee in the future, from data storage, from power to X, and what else that I can't imagine. And that's the point. I don't have to imagine it. Because if you have the system, then you have a potential, basically, channel of uh, getting rid of that and using it for something sensible. But if you don't have the district heating system, then you'll just be standing there with a lot of waste, basically. From the consumer perspective, you don't have to care about it. If I had an oil boiler, when I was a kid, we had an oil boiler, as I mentioned, but we got district heating. And my parents have never thought about it ever since. But at the same time, the district heating company, they have made a lot of changes in how they're producing it. Because in the beginning, it was simply a, uh, a CHP run on coal. But now they, or then later, they started with waste incineration. Later, they introduced uh, cooling or heating from, uh, from a cement factory. Later came heat from various different uh, sources. Crematorium even, yes. So uh, you have a lot of different sources that you can basically put into the system. But my parents, they wouldn't have to care about that. But without thinking about it, their system became uh, greener and greener, so to speak. So they didn't have to go out and do something. So it really takes a lot of the decision power away from the people, but it's also a decision power that they don't care about. They don't have to care about whether there's waste incineration or what. They have to care about whether they have uh, their own oil boiler or whether they have district heating. And with district heating, you can transform the system and it will be done with uh, other economic conditions, basically, than if you were a private house owner trying to do something. You have scale effects. You will actually have a professional organization. You can basically uh, make a transition with a lower interest rate because you don't have to go out and loan or get a loan with a relatively high rate interest rate maybe for a short period of time when you do these infrastructural investments from a district heating company then you can get a long-term loan and a relatively modest interest rate for instance so it's simply uh, more economically beneficial so we made the same chart for the, for the different generations of district heating. I'm not going to go through the different generations, but just show that. Visually, you have exactly the same image, that it is going from something very simple in the beginning, maybe simply a boiler, to something where you have numerous different kinds of units providing, and also providing exactly the same as for the district cooling, namely energy efficiency, convenience and energy systems flexibility and the ability to integrate other energy sources into the system. So if we look a little bit into the Danish system and see how that has developed, this is a map of Denmark 1985. We have some uh, central CHP stations, we have some ye large yellow dots which are local CHP stations, so not so many, and mainly in the big cities, or relatively big towns. And then we have some green dots, which were wind turbines at that time. So it was a somewhat complex system because we still had all the wind turbines, and the wind turbines, they were, they were kind of beyond control. The TSO couldn't turn them off. and. Uh, if the owner decided to shut it off or whatever, I mean, n nobody knew what was happening to them, basically. And, of course, the wind blows or, do or does not blow. The same with, the, with these small-scale CHP stations. 
they were operating according to some price signals. But still, maybe they were not operated completely professionally and basically they were not under the control of the TSO, whereas uh, the big power stations, there was actually a person sitting there, so if the TSO called them and say, you need to produce a bit more, then there was actually someone to do it, whereas in the small ones here, there was not. Moving ahead in time, this is a nightmare. No, it's not. But if you are a TSO from uh, outside of Denmark, you will consider this as the worst nightmare. Because now you have hundreds of these. There are like 400 dis different uh, yellow dots, 400 district heating systems here, and thousands of wind turbines, and uh, all of them outside control. So that's wha what I mean by this dispersion and diversification that we've had of the energy system. So basically, this geographical dispersion is, well, it's, if you are thermodynamic people, then you will know the Carnot efficiency, and you will know that uh, when you're producing electricity on an engine or a turbine, then you'll waste a lot of heat. And uh, moving it to all the places where you have a heat demand that enables you to basically uh, make use of that heat. And this is what we, we see on this map. We've also started with a lot of offshore wind farms. So uh, these are like two, 300 megawatts, 400 megawatts, 600 megawatts down there. So relatively large offshore wind farms also. So this has, as I said, for some people, this would be a nightmare. Fortunately, for the Danish TSO, they kind of uh, TSO, they kind of grew with the task. They learned about it. They learned as they went along. So it's not something that suddenly happened. I made a switch there in 30 years with a flip of a switch here, and that's not how it happened in reality. So there was a steep learning curve for the Danish TSO in trying to learn how to operate and basically handle such an energy system. One of the things that they found out quickly was that heat storage pro provided an immense flexibility for the system. So any Danish CHP plant has a heat storage. If you go to Germany and you see a comparable uh, district heating system, very often they will not have uh, heat storage simply because of other market structures in Germany than in Denmark, at least historically speaking. So in Denmark, everybody, they would be sitting there seeing, okay, how are the prices going to be? How can I optimize my production? Maybe that means uh, even though everybody takes a shower in the morning and therefore you have a peak in the heat demand, maybe it's better producing the heat at uh, 23 hours, 100 hours, in the evening and then storing the heat for later use. So all, diff all systems, they have a, a heat storage. So this is grouped from all the different uh, district heating systems we have. So 10,000 cubic meters, this is here. So that corresponds to a storage of 460, about half a gigawatt hour of, uh, of storage, basically. And you can see some of them, they're even uh, up to several gigawatt hours of, of storage. So they provide a lot of uh, flexibility for the system. What we also see is that we have seen a change in the stock of technologies in the different uh, district heating systems. So if we take the, the fat line, are uh, the, the engines, the number of engines have more or less been the same over time, the same with gas turbines, but they're actually seeing a decline here in the later years, and that's because they are not any more economically attractive. So if they had been installed like 20 years ago, when they are considering reinvesting in them, they will actually find out that it is not so interesting. So a lot of the thermal capacity on the district heating stations are being phased out, is being phased out. So the production on these units is also decreasing. So 
gas engines, they used to produce a lot if you go back to around 2000, but nowadays they are producing very little and even more so with uh, the gas turbines. They are simply too expensive to operate. We also have some other units, let me just briefly take them. We have the steam turbines up here at the top. They are still producing relatively lot. That's because I only have five minutes left. Seven, okay. Then I think I will move quickly and uh, start talking about Chile in a f few seconds. So the, 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 the steam turbines, they are operating in the big cities and that is uh, still being supplied by the big steam turbines. Okay, if I only have seven minutes left, then I will actually switch a little bit uh, because then I will talk a little bit about heat roadmap Chile. I think that's important to get to. Because uh, my colleagues, they made this heat roadmap Chile where they investigated what is the potential of uh, district heating in Chile. And we have some issues in the Chilean context. We have a high energy demand for heating. We have high levels of environmental pollution. I saw the presentation of uh, Francois Simon yesterday who said that uh, 10 million people, they had uh, unacceptable levels of, uh, of pollution here in Chile. So this is actually one of the main driving factors for this study. So this is not for energy convenience, it is not for cost, it is not for transition, this is basically for air quality. But, of course, we also have some derived effects. You might have noticed, Chile is a long country. The bluer it is, the colder it is. So, blue areas, you will find big heat potentials or heat demand potentials. They made this analysis, taking a point of departure in uh, in Chilean ministerial energy plans, the PELP scenario, and then they tried to redo the PELP scenario, but putting district heating into the system and making different uh, quantifications or different um, uh, sizes, different penetrations of, of district heating into the system and combining with different sources. District heating, of course, involves a cost. So it is very much related to the geographical structure, basically, of, of your system. So how high is your heat demand? This is a, a graph which is made based on heat roadmap Europe. So for a, a number of different systems in Europe, where they've tried to make, basically, a regression curve of what is the concentration of the heating demand and what is the cost of actually making a, a piping system. And of course, uh, the higher the heating demand is, the lower the relative cost of the heating system. That is hardly surprising. Uh, similarly, the losses in the district heating system is very relative to the concentration of the heating demand. So the higher the heating demand concentration, the lower the losses. They made the uh, geographical information systems analysis of Chile, where they took the building stock of Chile, the heating demand of different types of houses, and concentration is then higher in some areas, basically where you have build-up areas, where you have more square meters. So it's a matter of how many square meters you have basically per square meter of build area compared to build-up or how much uh, to urban area in general. So the red colors, they indicated a high heating demand, and the blue colors indicate a low heating demand. So I think this was, uh, yeah, this was uh, Santiago de Chile, this, uh, this chart here. So in the center, you have a nice heating demand that can actually be covered by, by district heating. We made different scenarios for different penetrations. And this chart here is uh, one of my final charts, basically showing the entire cost of running such a system. So this is investment cost, it is operating cost, it is everything, including transportation, heating, cooling, electricity, what else? So with no district 
heating, then you have a cost which is indicated by the line here. And then if you introduce district heating up to about 50% of the entire Chilean heating demand, then you will actually result in something which is marginally lower. I will not really stress that it's cheaper, but you can at least see that uh, it's comparable. It's not like it's uh, outrageously expensive, it's more or less the same deal. But of course, there are some very nice effects. I will skip this for time, this is just the kind of investments. But moving to the air pollution, so moving away from all the biomass-based individual boilers and going into technologies, there's a lot of wind turbines, there's a lot of heat pumps, there are other CHP units, and of course with CHP units then you can actually have professional flue gas purification as opposed to individual boilers. So you simply have some other possibilities. So with 40% district heating, you will have decreased emissions considerably and therefore also improving the air quality in Chile. Fuel usage, yes, we'll be phasing out some fuels. A lot of coal will be taking out natural gas about the same level, oil decreased by half. But even biomass, it's still on a relatively high level, but simply because you use it in different units, then you will avoid the air pollution. And now, I think my time has run out. Thank you very much. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Paul, for the excellent presentation. Uh, now we have around 10 minutes for, <laughs> for questions. Okay, so uh, when you ask questions, there's just your name, and then you can, uh, you can ask your questions. So please. Hi, thanks, Paul. Very clear talk. Yannick Haas from the University of Canterbury. Two questions. <laughs> um, I remember Christchurch in New Zealand having also air quality issues a couple of years ago, and then we had the Clean Air Act, so everybody has a heat pump now. So how does heat pump um, play into your modeling, and, and how does com that compare? Heat pumps, they're introduced where you don't have district heating. So heat pumps and uh, district heating, they are competitors. And now I'm talking about individual heat pumps. They will be competing against district heating because the district heating is also potentially with actual heat pumps. But you always have a competitive situation between those two technologies. Uh, they also analyzed, I didn't do the, these analysis myself, but they also analyzed uh, simply uh, individual heat pumps. But that was simply more expensive, and it does not give you the same benefits of, of the district heating system. And I would assume that in, uh, in a New Zealand context, uh, it would be the same, even though I don't know so much about yeah. the geography of the demand, but uh, in the big cities. Yeah, for, for us, I don't know. They're, they're dirt cheap. The heat pumps. <laughs> but uh, on your last slide, last, that's my second question. <laughs> um, the biomass that you mentioned is still part of it, but in a different shape. I was wondering if you can elaborate on, on what happens to biomass. Well, the biomass here, I mean, in the combo scenario, it's to a very large extent, it's being used in individual boilers and in the heat roadmap, Chile, it is used in uh, CHP stations. So basically, filters, you'll thing. have a biomass boiler and, uh, and a steam engine. No, steam engine, steam turbine. Uh, cannot, there will also probably be some uh, actual biomass boilers, but again, they will be district heating boilers and therefore with blue gas uh, purification. Okay, cool. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, okay. Thank you. I was wondering in this, in this graph where you show the, the, the progression of uh, district cooling. Most of the countries show a, some kind of a plateauing. Do you have an explanation for that? I think that's a matter of uh, low-hanging fruits. Uh -huh. And I think it's also a matter of uh, the technology being installed in new urban developments. So uh, to some extent, you're not going into old. I mean, La, La Défense in, in Paris, for instance, that's mm -hmm. one of the, the cases. That was a completely new urban development in, in France, you probably know. Uh, 
But once that was developed, that was kind of uh, that potential was harvested. So I think it is a matter of uh, urban development and uh, low-hanging fruit. Yeah, and actually that was uh, my, my follow-up question. To what extent is this a possible option for already constructed cities? Because, I mean, we've seen the size of those pipes. Um, it is something that is definitely easier to do if you are talking about new urban new developments. Development. Or at least it is something that is... It's the same with district heating. It is, it is clearly facilitated if you have a waterborne system in your buildings. So if you have a building with uh, individual heat pumps in every single window, as you will see in different places, that's very difficult to convert. But if you have a system which is based on water in a building, then you have, then it's a lot easier connecting to a grid. So it really depends on, on what you have already. But uh, anything which is already based on water will definitely provide better options mm. than all the small individual AC units. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Yeah, Stanis. Hello, thank you. This was uh, inspiring. And uh, I'm from uh, Opole University of Technology. Uh, we have uh, 25 years left to this uh, 2050. So how do you think, uh, is it reachable? What is heat, uh, heat road map Chilean? If it's reachable, well, first of all, when doing this, the end year is not necessarily seen as uh, the implementation is simply not taken into consideration. So uh, they are simply analyzing the end point. And then the question is, can you actually do that in, in 25 years? I think you have, I think this should not be seen as a, uh, like, a like a pathway towards a Chilean uh, district heating based system, but it should be seen as something, as a, a beacon, something to aim for, rather than something to implement directly. It is to be seen as what are basically the, the prospects of this technology. And whether you will reach uh, 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 percent in a given year, it's not so important, but it's more important to actually show that this is actually a relevant path to, to follow. And then, whether you can do it in 25 years, uh, I would uh, be doubtful. Thank you. But you can definitely take some of the low-hanging fruits. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question. OK, I can. Uh, oh, OK, um, maybe just one, uh, maybe connecting to what Stanislav was asking. Uh, maybe your comment on. Uh, how to overcome certain obstacles in implementing DC heating and cooling in South America, primarily from maybe socioeconomic, but technical uh, uh, perspective as well. I mean, you mentioned that the district heating is dominantly European or North European uh, 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 thing. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, there are certain obstacles like uh, how well uh, isolated uh, the buildings are, so it's much more easier to do it in North uh, uh, Europe where you have a good standard of isolation, etc. So what would be the, the main obstacles uh, in transferring district heating and cooling in, in uh, South America and how to overcome them? It is clearly capital intensive. I mean, the uh, upfront investment is large before you have any benefit out of the system. So somehow you need to have companies with a long planning horizon and which can basically afford to uh, not make money for the first years of operation, basically, or the first years of installation. So there's a, uh, what do you call that? That's definitely a socioeconomic issue of actually trying to form such companies. Uh, in Denmark, you can, if, you, if, I dis, if I move to a city without district heating, you can't really find them, but if I did, I could actually uh, say, I want to start a district heating system, and I would talk to my neighbors, and they say, oh, let's start a district heating system. Then I could go to the municipality and I say, uh, we want to start a district heating system, and we want you to guarantee our loan. And then they would be obliged to guarantee the loan. So we've, got, we've had this guarantee for loans for decades. 
And the funny thing is, it has never been called upon, this guarantee. Because uh, with the guarantee, you can go to the bank and they will give you the loan. Uh, they will give you uh, 15 million euros to make your district heating system. But it always pays in the end. So they've always been able to actually pay back the bank. So they have never, that guarantee system that we've had has never been used. Does it mean then, then for South America, it should be public related or public oriented funding? It, it is definitely easier that way. It doesn't have to, be, but I'm, like, the, like what I said, that was a purely, that was a bank uh, loan, etc., and there was private investors and so on. So it was not necessarily public. In Denmark, it's a mixture of public and private. I mean, in the big cities, it's public. Uh, in the smaller cities, it's private. So there's not like uh, one solution that, uh, that fits all. So it's a matter of historical context, how they have developed. Okay, thank you. Uh, Felipe, you, you had a question? Yeah. Um, so I'm actually from a city in the south of Chile that is called Temuco. And Temuco is the most polluted city in Latin America. Yes. And it's the most polluted city in Latin America because we basically heat our houses with biomass, uh, but it's wet wood, basically. And the problem is also that people use uh, this uh, heat not only for heating, uh, but also for cooking. Yes. So there is a lot of, yeah. uh, you know, de I'm thinking, you know, uh, going into district heating in cities like Temuco, which are, you know, a lot of uh, poor neighborhoods that basically use this also for cooking, might have some social uh, resistance. So I don't know if you have some uh, experience in Denmark how this is basically addressed or what are your views on, on, on that topic? I Actually, Timuku was also one of the cases uh, that was uh, on the map. Uh, I, I am aware of also like the social institution of having a wood-fired stove in the kitchen, which is also heating the, the building, and I don't, have the, uh, I don't have the big solution to that. Uh, just to say that it's no different from uh, what we used to have in Denmark. I mean, I'm, when I go back to my grandparents' house, not my parents' house, I mean, that would be the same thing in the countryside. They would have a wood-fired stove in the middle of the building in the, in the kitchen where they would do the cooking and uh, basically heating a lot of the house. Um, I think it's a matter of convenience also, whether you can take the, the social institution out of the out of the technology or provide the social institution in a different way, but uh, I'm not sure I have the, the, the grand solution to that. Okay, uh, another question? Uh, maybe to be a little bit provocative, uh, what would you say? Uh, uh, we reached till the fourth generation. Uh, wh what would be the next generation in, in this recooling or in, in heating? Do you have a perspective on that or opinion? Oh, there's, there's a large debate, at least in the, the district heating, whether there's a district heating generation 5 or 6 or 7 or whatever. I mean, you, it's only imagination that sets the limit. Uh, I know from uh, our perspective, I was one of the co-authors of an article outlining these uh, four generations, and what we see in a lot of uh, five generation is that, oh, that's what we would call four generation, but uh, they seem... They just wanted to up the ante a bit, and uh, basically, if they call it fifth, then it's better than fourth. Uh, but I, I think uh, fourth captures a lot of uh, what is going on in, in the most novel uh, systems. Of course, at some point, you might simply end up with, uh, with a flow of uh, ambient temperature water, basically, and then if you mm -hmm. are using it for heating, you can use it for heating. If you're using it for cooling, then you can use it for cooling. So it's kind of comparable to if you have a, a heat pump, which, is, uh, which has an evaporator in your garden, basically. So you have a big coil under your, uh, under your lawn. And then it, it will more or less resemble that system uh, simply with a, with a combined pipe for, for heating and cooling, or with more pipes with different temperature levels. So. Uh, Okay, uh, final chance since we ran out of time. Okay. Uh, of whether it is beneficial as compared to air conditioning. Sorry, which one, sorry? Uh, 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 sorry, uh, d district cooling. 
because I, I, I do get the, the gains when you, you may have different uh, fuels to generate heat, but yeah. here you directly compete with electricity. We, we, have, we have not compared the yeah. air conditioners to, to district cooling, no. That would be very interesting to know. Yeah, but there are a, a lot of different factors uh, that you can compare them by economic systems, but also the convenience and it's not something I've spoken about, but when you have uh, air conditioner units or heat pumps, basically, in, in individual houses, you have quite a lot of noise pollution. And I know you have some situations in some areas in Copenhagen without district heating where you have created, a, I don't know what, how to explain it, but uh, a hell of noise, basically. Because everybody, I mean, every single unit lives up to the standard. I mean, it's bought in Japan, it's good quality and all stuff. But uh, it meets the decibel requ requirements. But then when every single house in that building area, they put it up. This is something that is not captured by the, the technical or economic optimization. Okay, uh, Paul, thank you very much for this inspiring lecture. Uh, uh, thank you all for, for being here. And now we serve lunch and see you in an hour.